Robert Larson, it's a pleasure to have you here. Professor Larson, I should call you. Uh, world expert on economic systems. It's great to see you. It's been a few months. It has been, Jeff. Um, so I was riveted by a comment I saw. It was more of like an explosion on uh, somewhere on social media where you had something to say about the VA system. And I thought, who better to have on to talk about that and explain what the heck is going on than you? I mean, you've looked at healthcare systems all over the world. You seem to know what's right and what's wrong with them. Well, maybe. You know, that, that was a, you know, a silly Facebook comment. You know how those comments are. You don't know which ones are going to get a reaction, and that one got a reaction. Um, you know, the gist of it is this. I don't understand why everybody's upset at the VA. Well, people like me and you, we should be upset about the VA because we don't like government control of health care. But what I find is odd is CNN commentators, regular people who have been arguing for years about how we have a health care crisis that the government needs to fix, they've been using the VA as like their exhibit A of what works. And in a certain sense, it does work. You know how it works? They get a lot of people in a system. There's only one payer. It's a single payer system. The government pays. And they deny coverage to people. They deny care. They say, you know what, Jeff, I'm sorry that you're sick, but this, this operation is going to cost $500,000. It only is going to improve your quality of life a little bit. And frankly, it's just not worth it. And the VA basically keeps its costs down by making the decision to deny care to people. And frankly, I'm, like, I'm kind of okay with this because a lot of healthcare spending is a complete waste. But here it is now, 2014, and this is somehow now coming to light in the public. And it's a scandal. Well, why is this a scandal? This is, this is how the VA works. This is how it works in Canada. This is how it works in England. The reason they get health care cheap only, you know, under 10% of GDP is because they deny people care. <laughs> I, you know, if that's the world you want to live in, that's fine. But you don't, in my world, you don't get to simultaneously complain about how high, how expensive health care is in the United States and then complain about the only way that we know how to keep it under control, which is by denying people care. Yeah, just just less service actually makes everything cheaper. That's sort of well, the way it, it works. Does. It, it, it's it's not so much price controls that it's quantity con quantity control. Yeah, uh, that's well, what works in Canada and in, in England. Well, let, let me ask you this. Um, uh, uh, first of all, I didn't. I'm not sure I understood that the VA had been held out for years as being a, a model of how the single payer system works. That that's interesting to me. It reminds me of Lenin's uh, having held up the post office as an example of how socialism can work. <laughs> that's right. Well, you know, again, it works on on their terms. If by their terms you mean providing basic health care to a lot of people relatively cheap in the same way that the, health, the post office delivers mail to a lot of people relatively cheap. If that's the terms that you are operating under, then the VA is actually a model. Now, my model isn't the post office or the VA. My model is, you know, Federal Express <laughs> and Amazon and, and, and things like that. Um, but if you just want to live in this sort of socialist world where you get some goodies and uh, the government decides what, what goodies they're willing to pay for, you can keep costs down, and, and, and they do it in the VA. Um, you know, I just don't understand why people would be all of a sudden upset. That's the world they've been wanting us, by they I mean most people on the left, they've been wanting us to move toward for so long. And now we get the reality of it, and they don't have the stomach for it. Well, how, 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 do you have any insight as to, mainly because I haven't read many stories about this, but how, how did this become a kind of, quote, scandal, unquote, as versus, like, the other 10 billion scandals that are part of the public sector. I mean, how did this actually like emerge? Suddenly? Right. Yeah. Gosh knows how these things ever ever come out. I guess obviously it's 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 a scandal more about the VA administrators lying about doing this. Because you know, if you're a VA administrator, your your job is to keep your your little part of the VA on budget. If you don't if you go over budget, you're in trouble. You know, that's a bureaucratic no no. So uh, how do you keep yourself on budget? Well, you you you, set, you you keep care down. You you tell people, all right, well, that service isn't available. You instruct hospitals and doctors to, to, to instill waiting lists. But, of course, that's very politically 
incorrect. You know, this is America. We don't have waiting lists. That's what Canadians have. So what do you do? Well, you lie about it. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's as usual with, with these sorts of scandals. It's not the initial misdeed. It's more of the the cover up that's that's causing the problem. And that's why these people are getting in trouble. It's not because they did it, but because they lied about doing it. But I think that's why it came out to the public. But if you listen to the to the popular reaction, it's oh my gosh, the VA has got waiting lists. I'm like, well, of course they do. How did you think they keep it so cheap? I mean, there's no other way to keep it that cheap unless you restrict the, the access to the care. That's how it works. And that, that was my sort of complaint on, on the, the social media uh, comment. Yeah. Is there, do you have any uh, sense of how the system actually works? Like if you have access to, to VA system, um, can you opt out of it and, and go elsewhere or are you kind of stuck or how does that, how does that actually work? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're a veteran and you, and you are eligible for the VA, you can have your own health insurance, and most veterans presumably do, and they have through their employer in the usual manner. So the VA is kind of, I don't want to, it's not fair to say it's a Medicare or Medicaid, but it's, it's kind of like the, the last gasp uh, for veterans who don't have, you know, more traditional, you know, by traditional, I mean in the American style insurance. Um, I, don't, I don't know anything about the numbers, about the percentages, and, and people yeah. going on and off the, the system. But, um, but primarily, I think it is sort of a, a last refuge for veterans who don't have access to regular insurance. And, and, and these sort of slow-going, endless uh, wars and conflicts that the U.S. is involved in lead to in, intensified demand for services on all, all fronts. But... Uh, but the supply is unresponsive because it's allocated by politics instead of market signaling. No, no, no question. I'm sure that there's. I mean, obviously, we've had we've had an expansion in the number of people serving the military, and then of course an expansion in the in the 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 injuries, the, the uh, you know, casualties, and so on uh, that are associated with that. Not just physical injuries, but mental health, you know, post traumatic stress, and things like this. The VA gets a good, you know chunk of that that uh, that, that kind of healthcare stuff. Um, so I, I'm sure that some of the pressure here, and the reason this is maybe coming to light now is is because you're right, the demand for their services is increasing and you know budgets in Washington being what they are, they they go up every year, but they don't go up necessarily to to you know reflect demand. They just go up, you know, the usual sort of, well last year you had this, so this year you get this, that plus a little bit more. So I mean, it's normal normal way for government budgeting to work. Well, how, how, I mean, what is the upshot of this? It's I guess you know a guy gets fired. There's 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 hearings. There's bad, bad headlines. But but in the end, uh, uh, Congress does its patriotic duty by vastly increasing the budget, right? No, yeah, probably what probably that's what happens. Um, that's what usually happens. Uh, and you know, like most scandals, it'll just go away. We'll probably have another few here or there. Um, but again, I, I think when when we look at the big picture. And and we, I, I, we do have some problems with healthcare. I mean, we spend way too much money on healthcare. And, and if you look at the data, it's just hard to argue that we're getting our money's worth. And and um, so to a certain extent, I I've always sort of liked the VA, and not the fact that it was government run, but for the fact that they had the, you know, they had the the willingness to say to pay, to people, you know what, that five hundred thousand dollar surgery, just it doesn't make sense to, to give that to you because, you know, <laughs> it's not going to really increase your quality of life enough. It may only work 10% of the time or something. So it's just not worth it. And we need a system that's more willing to do those kinds of choices. And to, to, to its credit, <laughs> the VA actually does that. Um, I'd like to see that more in a private system. I would like to see us empower our insurance companies. But here's the irony. Uh, what happens if your insurance company says, Jeff, that $500,000 surgery isn't worth it. We're going to deny it. Well, then, oh, my gosh, the Democrats, everybody freaks out because, you know, health care is our right, blah, blah, blah. So it's okay for the VA yeah. to operate this way, but it's not okay for the private sector to operate this way. I'd actually like to see the private sector operate more like the VA in this dimension, in the, in the sense that they have the ability to say to people, you know, hey, these services are just not cost effective for us to operate. We can give them to you, but if we give them to you, you know, next year your premiums are going to go up 25%, and you know there's no free lunch. So right. we need to live in that kind of world. 
Well, Bob, I was I was at uh, uh, um, at a uh, what do you call uh, the the dog doctor guy um, veterinarian clinic, and a guy was had a dog there, and they gave the guy like three choices. They said, well, here's here's ten dollars to kind of uh, uh, just f fix a little bit of the problem here. Here's here's a uh, two hundred dollars to go more deeply and maybe uh, fix it for long term and prolong life. Here's here's a five hundred dollars to do that and this and gave him a series of services and, and basically presented the the pet owner with a kind of a, a range of options. Uh, and I sat there just kind of amazed. I thought, well, isn't this more or less the way a market would work in healthcare if if there were a market? I mean, that you would have a range of, of prices and services available and you would pick based on you know your resources and and uh, your sense of the trade-offs and 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 uh, your judgment concerning the va value uh, given and received. It is, and and that that is how it works everywhere else. Again, people want to live in a fantasy world. They want to live in a world where they can get all their health care for free. But then when the bill comes in, you know, when they get their bill for when they when the HR sends out the announcement that next year's health premiums are up another ten or fifteen percent, then they freak out. Well, you can't live in both of those worlds. You know, you you know, you can't complain about. You can't get everything you want for free, and then complain when the bill comes in. And that's the world we've been trying to trying to live in. Well, I'm I'm sure you've you've watched a little bit of the unfolding of Obamacare. I've I've began to suspect that the real problem problems with Obamacare are uh, not quite so public. They're they're made in these little marginal decisions on the part of health insurers not to cover things, or not even. The decision not to cover them, but the introduction of, uh, of enough bureaucratic sort of barriers to discourage uh, uh, people from um, using the insurance for, for coverage that is presumably coverage in the contract, but but people aren't adhering to every every point. In other words, they're looking for ways to, to cut back, right? I mean, that's right. Obama vastly expanded the coverage. Uh, at least on paper, but in reality, we're going to see ever more rationing through these kind of micro decisions on the part of insurers, don't you think? Absolutely, reality exists. We have no choice. I mean, you can't simultaneously subsidize the demand, restrict the supply, and and not have prices. You know, so something has to give in this system. And I, I think you're absolutely 100% correct that um, we are going, and we we, we're, we it exists in the VA, it exists in Medicaid, it exists in Medicare. And increasingly, it's going to exist in our private system. Obamacare isn't going to let private insurers pass along these costs. Obamacare is nominally, as you note, mandating all these extra services. Right. So if you can't pass on extra costs and you mandate extra services, how is reality going to work out here? Well, the answer is probably going to be increasing bureaucratic snafus, more more trouble with your insurance companies and things. Yeah, like more that. trouble. Than, I mean, I only have... We'll blame it on the private sector. We'll blame it on yeah. capital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I only have a, a slight bit of experience. It's like you can't really read about this stuff in the newspapers or whatever, but I had a, just a slight experience with a, a very innocuous nothing kind of pill that I've been taking since I was like 15 or something like that. I went into uh, the drugstore and tried to get it filled, and they said, well, you know, our insurance is going to cover this until the doctor gives a more thorough explanation of why you need this. Wow, there you go. Yeah. And, and I thought, so I'm supposed to go back to that guy over there, like, and stand in line again and bug him and get him to write a more thorough explanation and come back and present that to you, and then you file it, and then they say, well, that's not enough, and I go back again, and so on and so on, right? So I asked the lady at the counter, I said, what's really going on? They said, well, they don't want to cover it. Yeah. And I, and I said, okay, that's fine. I'll just pay the market price and move on, you know, but I thought, well, chalk one up for the victory, uh, victory for the insurers, you know, and, and how often is this happening? I mean, this is, this is going all the time. That wasn't declined. Yeah. Yeah. It was just delayed. You, you know, know I, I'm no, I don't want to be a shill for insurance companies, but you know, I, we, I've had experience with car insurance, house insurance, you know, tree falls on a house, car gets yeah. an accident. And I don't know about your experience in these kind of situations. And I'm sure there are horror stories here. But my experience has been pretty, pretty doggone good. I have coverage on my car. I wreck my car. They come out. They take a look at it. They write me a check. Mm -hmm. They don't want to write me a check, <laughs> obviously, but they honor their contract. I've had very fair, I think, very fair dealings with other insurance companies. Sure. Healthcare is different. For one thing, it's not really insurance, but that's a whole separate argument. But it, they, they see they're in a, they're in a rock and a hard place because it's so politicized. Yeah. They aren't able to fully pass on these costs. 
so they can't say yes to everybody. They need a mechanism to say no, and the mechanism is what you just described. It's well, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's brilliant, actually. I mean, I, I mean it's an, for me, I, like, I'm impressed by markets anyway, but I'm like even more impressed by markets that deal with gigantic government apparatus that is trying to make them not work, and they find creative solutions around it. I mean, that's what most impresses me about markets, is its capacity to sort of move around the barriers, you know? And this, I mean, you know, it, it was annoying to happen to me, but I'm, I'm impressed, you know? Well, as Adam Smith noted, the, the uh, propensity to truck barter and exchange is very powerful, and we do it in spite of the impediments the state puts in front of us. Yeah, it's amazing. And it is a powerful process. I mean, it works all over the world. Thank God for it. Yeah. I mean, if, if yeah. you know, if people honored the rules and regulations around the world, we'd all starve to death, so... <laughs> um, so as long as we're talking about around the world, um, I, I just would like to ask you a question that I had asked you one time, I think, when we were in Texas, and because I'm, I'm very interested in this, but but it seems like, you know, after all the command economies in Eastern Europe uh, fell apart and uh, the old Soviet style, you know, so-called socialism fell apart. Uh, you know, when China reformed its economy, there's been very little attention to the privatization of, of healthcare systems. Those uh, persist around the world in state-based models. And I, I wonder if you find in your research that, that that is generally true, that it's kind of a universal function of the state, widely perceived to be such, and, and why that is. Well, you know, healthcare is only really an exclusive function of the state in, in a handful of very rich, wealthy countries. And those are the ones people want to talk about, you know, Canada, Sweden, and so on. The vast majority of countries, healthcare is private. Yeah, there's a, a public system, but it's, it's like the post office. It's dark and dreary. You go there as a last resort, and if you're poor. Um, but anybody with means, and, and, and that, you know, if, it depends on the scale. So a, a middle-class Indian, to you and me, would be horribly poor. But a middle-class Indian who maybe makes, uh, you know, a few thousand dollars a year, which would make him poor here, uh, will have access to a, a private health care system that, uh, you know, varies in quality, to be sure, yeah. but is, is, is uh, you know, quite reputable, actually. People who come back from America will go to India for health care. Um, so the, these health, private health care, this is true in Latin America, it's true in the old Soviet Union, yeah. it's all over the world. It's not true that, that, that we're the only country that has a, you know, a marginal, you know, that hasn't totally socialized our health care. It's simply not true. So um, that's probably true in China, too. There's probably a, a, a state system, but it's, it's yeah. kind of like their post office. Uh, it, it, nobody uses it. It's not really relevant uh, to people's lives. And, and as soon as you have the means, you're out and moved on to the private system. I don't know for China for sure, but India is definitely that way. Yeah. I mean, absolutely for, sure, for certain that way. Uh, and, yeah, again, the quality varies, and you get what you pay for. And there's there's inequality in the things that, that some people don't like. Yeah. But you'd be surprised what a typical person can get and how cheaply they can get it in India or in Guatemala or whatever. Uh, uh, you know, again, a poor person's poor, but and you can't. That's what poor means. You know, the definition of poor means it's hard to buy things. Um, I'm not making light of it here. I'm just saying that that's what it means. Um, so if you're a poor person in India or a poor person in Guatemala, yeah, you've got a tough situation. Period, including in your healthcare decisions. But if you're a middle class person, not a rich person, but you have a really quite a good healthcare system available, provided privately, at very affordable costs compared to what we have. I mean, you know, a middle class person can't walk in and get good healthcare very easily out of pocket in this country. I mean, it's quite unaffordable, um, except through. Well, it gives the impression that there's one system for the rich, one system for the poor, um, but. You wonder what would happen in a world where the markets were not, where governments were not crowding out uh, private solutions. If we would have long ago achieved a kind of a, a universal ideal, if you want to call that, through market means. Well, I mean, I, there is. I think it is fair to say there is one system for the rich and one system for, for the poor. Um, but the real problem is there's a lot of poor people. I mean, the real trick is to not have as many poor people. Yeah. I, I, let me put it this way: we have a totally privatized food delivery system in the United States. We have restaurants and grocery stores that are entirely privately run in our country. We have a capitalist system. And we have different systems for rich people and poor people. The rich people go to Whole Foods and the poor people go to Safeway. The rich <laughs> people go to the fancy five-star restaurant and the rest of us go to Applebee's. 
we have a different system. But who can argue that the Safeway is a bad grocery store, that you get bad food at Applebee's? In fact, I, I love Safeway and Applebee's, so I, you know, I don't know what that... So, yeah, the system is unequal, <laughs> and that's what it means to have rich and poor. There's nothing we can do about that, maybe. But, but I think the trick is to elevate the, the poor to the point where they're, they're shopping in Safeways and Applebee's for their, for their food instead of, you know, starving in the streets. Um, so that, that I mean that's my answer. I mean we have we have that system now in, in say food delivery. We I think if we had, didn't have all the government things we have now, we would have that in, in uh, healthcare in the United States. It wouldn't be equal. Yeah, I mean rich people go to the Cleveland Clinic or whatever. You know that's yeah. what they do. Uh, I'm going to go to the hospital down the street when I you know need need an arm you know a knee replacement. You know it's not as good as I'm sure the Cleveland Clinic is. Okay, but you know what the, the hospital down the street is pretty doggone good. Um, you uh, you spend most of your 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 time um, and your professional life accounting and trying to index economic freedom around the world, uh, and coming up with a, a kind of a, a list, a way to empirically compare uh, degrees of freedom with degrees of economic growth and income and that sort of thing. Um, how does healthcare figure into your accounting for overall economic freedom? Is it is it because you, what you're describing sounds very complicated? How do you account for this in your index? Yeah. Yeah, because you know our index is pretty crude. I mean, I think it's very useful, of course, but it's not really fine-tuned enough to get into the minutia of, of how governments spend their money. So we have government spending numbers. We have indicators for how much governments spend. Sweden gets a relatively low rating. The U.S. gets a sort of middle-of-the-pack rating and so on. But we don't really do much in the indexes uh, with respect to the, to the composition of spending. So whether it's spent on... on Healthcare or daycare centers or aircraft carriers to, to us a dollar is a dollar, um, and and even if I wanted to 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 make those kind of distinctions, the data that we have just for, especially for 152 countries, the data yep. we have don't really allow us to decompose government spending down really well. We can barely get like the aggregate number of spending, much less the sort of disaggregated numbers for for, for countries that we can compare across countries. Does that mean that Obamacare will not make a contribution to calling, causing the U.S. to slip further down the list than it already is? To the extent Obamacare is mostly a regulatory thing, it's not going to direct. It certainly won't affect the spending much. Uh, there's there's some spending, of course, implications, government spending, but not much. Now we do have regulatory measures, and those are a little softer, and those tend to be more um, survey based. So they do allow. Um, they're not surveys that we run, but but surveys that are run by other organizations. And those surveys, I think, do a, a pretty credible job of picking up uh, the sort of the severity of the regulatory environment. And so to the extent Obamacare is piling on a more you know, strict regulatory environment, we, we should see you know, some movements there. Unfortunately, it's hard to tie the movements in those surveys directly to Obamacare versus, say, the new clean air rules versus, say, whatever you know, new thing comes out. Whatever kind of crazy wish list of fantasy BS Washington's come up with uh, yesterday. Yeah, that's about yeah. right, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Bob. It's really wonderful to see you. Uh, when does the next index come out? Well, it comes out in October, but just today, by coincidence, I sent the final numbers to my publisher. And I could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you and all sorts. You know, the <laughs> because what Wall Street would go crazy, or yeah, well, you know, it's surprising. There are people who are interested in these in these numbers. Uh, I don't think you could trade on this information, really. It's it's, but well, I don't know. Maybe you could, but I'm not rich, so I if I if you could trade on it, I probably would figure out how to do it. That's amazing. So but there are people that are interested in 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 this politically, and, and we want to keep it quiet. So it really is like this between now and October. You're gonna have people kind of like buying you drinks and. You know. I wish, you know, I, I you know, <laughs> there there have been rumors about that. None of it's come my way apparently. I live in Dallas. No one wants to come to Dallas. So. <laughs> if I can get you to Freedom Fest, I'll buy you a, a, a Jen Gimlet and and see if I can get you to at least tell me the thing that everybody I'll cares about. It all over the internet. I'll maybe tell you. Yeah. <laughs> it's really great to see you, Bob. Take care. Yeah, take care. Bye bye. Yeah. Uh, that's well, first in Canada and in, in England. Well, let, let me ask you this. Um, uh, uh, first of all, I didn't, I'm not sure I understood that the VA had been held out for years as being uh, a model of how the single-payer system works. That, that's interesting to me. It reminds me of Lenin's uh, having held up the post office as an example of how socialism can work. 
<laughs> That's right. Well, you know, again, it works on on their terms. If by their terms you mean providing basic health care to a lot of people relatively cheap, in the same way that the health, the post office delivers mail to a lot of people relatively cheap. If that's the term, this is how it works in England. The reason they get health care cheap, only, you know, under 10% of GDP, is because they deny people care. <laughs> I, you know, if that's the world you want to live in, that's fine. But you don't, in my world, you don't get to simultaneously complain about how high, how expensive health care is in the United States and then complain about the only way that we know how to keep it under control, which is by denying people care. Yeah, just just less service actually makes everything cheaper. That's sort of the well, way it, it works. Does. It, it, it's, it's not so much price control, it's, it's quantity, con quantity control. Robert Larson, it's a pleasure to have you here. Professor Larson, I should call you. Uh, world expert on economic systems. It's great to see you. It's been a few months. It has been, Jeff. Um, so I was riveted by a comment I saw. It was more of like an explosion on uh, somewhere on social media where you had something to say about the VA system that I thought, who better to have on to talk about that and explain what the heck is going on than you? I mean, you've looked at healthcare systems all over the world. You seem to know what's right and what's wrong with them. Well, maybe. You know, that, that was a, you know, a silly Facebook comment. You know how those comments are. You don't know which ones are going to get a reaction, and that one got a reaction. Average to people. They do not care. They say, you know what? Jeff, I'm sorry that you're sick, but this this operation is going to cost $500,000. It only is going to improve your quality of life a little bit, and frankly, it's just not worth it. And the VA basically keeps its costs down by making the decision to deny care to people. And frankly, I'm, like, I'm kind of okay with this because a lot of healthcare spending is a complete waste. But here it is now. 2014, and this is somehow now coming to light in the public, and it's a scandal. Well, why is this a scandal? This is this is how the VA works. This is how it works in Canada. Um, you know, the gist of it is this: I don't understand why everybody's upset at the VA. Well, people like me and you, we should be upset about the VA because we don't like government control of healthcare. But what I find is odd is CNN commentators, regular people who have been arguing for years about how we have a health care crisis that the government needs to fix, they've been using the VA as like their exhibit A of what works. And in a certain sense, the VA does work. You know how it works? They get a lot of people in a system. There's only one payer. It's a single-payer system. The government pays. And they deny care.